We are terraforming the wrong planet. Terraforming, eco-engineering on a global scale, is a concept that's been around for more than a century. When most people hear the word terraforming, they tend to think about it as something happening on some other planet in the distant past or far future. <clears throat> in science fiction, human beings travel to Mars and Venus and the moons of Jupiter to make those places more like home. In War of the Worlds, Martians come to Earth with the exact same idea. Few of these tales tend to end well for anyone from any planet. Meanwhile, the terraformation of our own world is well underway. Unlike the global climate catastrophes that affected the faces of our two neighboring planets, this one is ours to affect, is ours, if we wish, to fix. And a question that many people are asking is, what can I do to help assure that the next chapter in Earth's story ends well? My recommendation is, become a Martian. My name is Shana Gifford, and I am a Martian, sort of. I spent 380 days in simulated space. I was the crew physician on the longest space simulation in US history. 366 contiguous days at 2,500 meters above sea level. When not living in a dome near the top of a volcano, I'm a rehabilitation doctor. I have the privilege of watching human beings rebound from terrible calamities, relearn how to walk and talk and try to return to their normal lives. When living in simulated space with five other people and speaking to no other humans for the better part of a year, I have the opportunity to see what life might be like when humans finally get to Mars. And what I observed about human life in space is that it is tremendously Earth-friendly. The Martian Survival Guide reads just like the UN 10 Steps for Saving the Planet. This planet, you know, the one where you may or may not recycle your beverage container after you're done with it. There was a three-month queue for beverage containers on simulated Mars. Our astrobiologist, Cyprian Verso, wanted it for his bacteria. Our soil scientist, Carmel Johnston, wanted them for her plants, and I wanted them to cultivate human food, and so on. On simulated Mars, recycling, turning off the power, and peddling to produce energy aren't choices. They aren't lifestyles, they're life. They're the way life functions in a place where resources have been and always will be so limited. We can learn a lot from some place that has no waste, not even waste. In space, something wants that waste. The power system, the plants, your thirsty crewmates. Be it urine or feces, a tuna can or your exhaled breath, Whatever it is, wherever it came from, it belongs and is needed by your crew, by the mission, by the planet, to survive. Not a Pringles can, not an oil bottle, not a tuna jar was immune. Absolutely everything and anything got reused. Which, you know, probably confused Mission Control a little bit when the six of us kept requesting two kilo jars of pretzels. And certainly, we were confused when Mission Control would do things like tell us to sacrifice one of our few precious glass jars in order to do something simple, like make 3D printer glue. When instructions like that came over the 20-minute time delay from Earth, the Martians would smile and nod and find another solution to the problem, and the next problem, and the next. And that right there is what I want for Earth from space. The solutions, the technological and ecological and social solutions. Because we did what we did without anybody dying or quitting or coming to blows over resources. That's what I want, for us to learn those lessons and apply them and be able to live as species adapted to our environments on Mars, on Earth everywhere we go in the universe. Now, <clears throat> that's, you know, not to say that we shouldn't ask ourselves some big-picture questions. 
just because we keep ourselves on track and conserving, we can still ask things like, what would it take to make Mars human-friendly? Can we repeat the experiment there that we're running here and add greenhouse gases to the planet, warm things up, make it more Earth-like? Well, Mars is as cold as it is, in part, because it lacks a planetary magnetosphere. Without that magnetic shield in place, the sun's solar wind comes by and strips Mars' atmosphere away, all day long, every day. So, if someone were to set us up the bomb and blow the Martian poles straight into the atmosphere, those greenhouse gases wouldn't stay there for long. Meanwhile, all that water, ice, and CO2 not to mention, perhaps, some of the local residents of the poles, would be gone. So, protecting past, current, and future life on Mars may require us to not blow up the poles. All right, so maybe if we're not going to bomb Mars into habitability, we could do something else. Maybe we could turn the thermostat up, slowly. Maybe we could build a giant shield between Mars and the Sun and deflect some of those solar winds and other particles away. That way, Mars could turn up its own temperature, its own pressure, build its own atmosphere. And indeed, this is technically possible. With a proper solar shield in place, Mars could become Earth-like, with weather and water and people walking around the surface without spacesuits on in about 700 million years or so. So there you have it. Safely terraforming a frigid planet next door is slow work. Meanwhile, unsafely terraforming a beautiful, habitable world into something like Venus can happen rather quickly. Venus is already Earth's twin in a number of ways in terms of size and mass, were very much the same. When both planets had just formed, we believe Venus had oceans, and that its surface temperature was quite like Earth's, only 20 degrees C hotter the time. So what changed? Well, at some point in Venus's history, a greenhouse gas runaway took place. The rocks were no longer able to absorb the carbon. It lifted up into the atmosphere, where it became CO2. Now, Venus is so hot that rocks on Venus can melt. Lead exists in liquid form, and no form of organic life that we understand can survive on the surface. By adding CO2 into our atmosphere and taking away the plants that take CO2 out of the atmosphere, we are terraforming our planet into something like Venus. Meanwhile, the terraformation of Mars into something like Earth, if at all possible, would be very slow. Fortunately, when motivated, human beings can change very quickly. The six of us changed from one day to the next. We went from people freely walking around the world, driving and texting, not at the same time, to only being able to go outside in spacesuits, and living in a dome where we grew plants under grow lights, and only saw trees and rivers and other human beings not on the crew through virtual reality. We uh, expanded our palettes. We named our plants and our yogurt cultures and our bread cultures, and our everything, the way you would a pet. And those expanded palettes sometimes included those pets, and grass, and crickets, and cyanobacteria, what you might call spirulina. If Martians are the greenest creatures in the solar system, the spirulina milkshakes are partially to blame. But look, I'm not here to ask you to befriend microbes or drink them as we did. And I'm certainly not here to ask you to live in a uh, 111 square meter dome with five other people and no internet. Though if you did, it wouldn't kill you. Quickly. <laughs> I am here to tell you 
that if we want Earth to continue to sustain life more complex than what I can grow in a mason jar, and if you want to continue having a choice about whether or not you live in a dome on the surface of this planet, we need to all assume a more Martian lifestyle. A lifestyle that consists of making active, sustainable choices with members of our community, with our friends, with our family, with our cities, with our countries. Active, sustainable choices about the use and reuse of resources. Active, sustainable choices about water and power conservation, about what we eat so that we eat what's best for us and best for the planet. Those are my Martian survival tips for Earth. And granted, some are easier than others. But I didn't come here to tell you that making active, sustainable choices was going to be easy all the time. But that making sustainable choices is now necessary if we're to continue living on this planet. You know, I used to believe that the way to go would be to go to Mars and make it more like Earth. And then I went to Mars and I simulated it for a year. And I re-emerged into this world. And I had patients in my rehabilitation hospital who had suffered terrible things, strokes and worse. And now they're adapting to their new lives. Lives without vision, speech, without memory. I admire them. They're very brave as they try to live new lives that they've been forced to live. I don't want that for you, for any of you. I want you to choose to adapt before you're forced to. I want you to choose active, sustainable choices. And I know that can seem hard, especially after today. There are so many to choose from. Well, that's what you get for living on a planet with so many beautiful things, so many resources, so much to love, so much to care about and care for. So care for it. Find those things that motivate you and write one quick email a day to a decision maker who can affect that. Make one phone call a week to that person. Make one appearance at a public gathering that supports the planet and your fellow humans. Eat one plant-based meal a day so that we have the resources to feed the seven billion of us and you cut down on your odds of having a heart attack and a stroke. I challenge you to do this as a Martian, but also as a fellow human being and as a doctor, because what 15-minute visit with a doctor would be complete without a little lecture on diet and exercise, right? <laughs> yeah, you probably thought I was gonna come here today and say, hey everybody, it's time to go to Mars and make it like Earth. Surprise! Yeah, and me too, me too. That's what I really thought we should do. For my entire life, literally since adulthood, I labored to make that a reality. I studied and I engineered and I researched, and then I spent a year on simulated Mars. And I reemerged back into this world. And I realized that I had been approaching the problem backwards. Now I want Earthlings to live like Martians, well adapted to our environment, making active, daily, sustainable choices, using the skills to, that, we, that we need to survive on that planet, to survive on this one, while there's still time. Thank you.